Okay, so uh, I have decided to do uh, about half of this lecture. I mean, it will be a lecture, but in the remainder, we'll uh, solve out some problems. And uh, my student from Penn State is here, Jen. Genuine, and he will. He has agreed to help out with the solutions to the problems. Okay, so all of you should have received a problem set, and uh, maybe some of you received it earlier by email. No. Okay. So anyway, uh, so what I would like to do is uh, to tell you how to understand the problem of the integer quantum Hall effect. So just to remind you, we, we learned that from very general arguments, uh, we can show that the Hall resistance is H over mu e squared for a system which uh, has translational invariance. Okay. So this follows very generally. Uh, and the question is, uh, how do we how do we understand the existence of plateaus? So you remember, again, to make sure we understand the puzzle. Uh, the experiment looks like this. As we are varying d, d goes like inverse of the filling factor. So we are varying the filling factor. And uh, plateaus means that there are regions of the, there are regions where the Hall resistance does not depend on the filling factor. It's just completely invariant to changes in the filling factor. So that's what we would like to understand. So uh, there is a neat, explanation by this, by Laughlin. It's called Laughlin's gauge argument. And uh, this uh, has a topological flavor, as you'll see. In fact, the quantization of the Hall resistance can be understood as a topological quantity because, uh, as, as was explained earlier by Jadeep, uh, topological quantities have the property that they are invariant under continuous changes in the Hamiltonian. So as we are changing the filling factor, we are changing the Hamiltonian, but the Hall resistance does not change. So you can see that uh, it is a topological object, and indeed one can uh, understand it in a topological fashion, and this is one way to do that. So, uh, so we are going to do the following. First of all, let me uh, let me consider a sample like this. This is the x direction, and what I will do is I will do a two-step calculation. The first step would be to uh, do the calculation for a system precisely at an integer filling uh, and obtain the result that I had showed earlier. So that's a more complicated way to do the calculation, if you wish. But then we will see how the result remains unchanged even when we put some disorder or even when we change the filling factor away from the special value, okay? So let's first imagine that we are, we have no disorder, and uh, I want to write the current in the x direction. So current in the x direction will have, uh, so if this is my current density, so I, I take a line, like this, and calculate all the, so from the current density uh, in the x, I take the x component of the current density and integrate over this line. That's the current going along the x direction. Now, this does not depend on which line I take here because of current continuity. 
So I might as well integrate it over this. So I can I can choose a line at any point along the x direction and I get the same answer. So the result does not depend on x. Therefore I can integrate for simplicity also over x, but I need to remember that I divide by the length of the sample. So let's say this is the length of the sample. And uh, this is my Jx. J has the formula that, so remember J is minus rho E V. So it has the formula, there's a negative sign, but I'm not going to be very careful with the signs. Uh, there is an E, there is density, and there is the velocity along the x direction. Okay, so that's just the current along the x direction. Now I'm going to write this density as sum over j. And then I'm going to do the integral. So I get this formula. Okay, so that's the current. Now how do we calculate this? So let's go to the Hamiltonian. And we had earlier So I am uh, not worrying about the interactions yet. It's a uh, Hamiltonian for non-interacting particles. But I'm going to insert a test vector potential, which will allow me to do the calculation. And I'm going to insert this text, test vector potential here. So the T here stands for test. And furthermore, I'm going to assume that this A test is so it has this form. It it's uh, pointing along the x direction and it's phi t over L. Phi t is some fixed fixed quantity. Uh, in fact, I'm going to take the test flux to be. I'm going to measure the test flux in units of phi naught. So I will say that the test flux test flux is alpha phi naught. So. There is a nice interpretation for this because of the following. Remember, we had assumed periodic boundary conditions for the sample. Okay. So uh, what that what that means is that this this sample effectively has the topology of of this type of a of a of a ribbon like this and. Uh, if you ask what is the flux through the ribbon, I mean through this uh, uh, cylinder, if you wish, then integral, so if I integrate over the flux like this, and I take dl to be along the x direction, then integrating all the way around is, it just gives me a factor of L, and this is alpha phi naught. Okay. So this test flux that I have inserted here into the Hamiltonian, it corresponds to a flux alpha phi naught passing through the cylinder 
passing through the axis of the cylinder. Okay. So, uh, so why are we doing this? Well, for the following reason. Uh, so, I'm going to come back here and I'm going to say that this thing, so what's the, what's the x component of the velocity? It's a uh, So the x, I mean the velocity in the presence of a magnetic field is given by this and we take the expectation value of, of this quantity. Now I can write it in a nice form because this thing, this quantity is rela related to the Hamiltonian if I take derivative with respect to the test flux. So, uh, So I can write it in this fashion, minus C. Okay. So in fact, uh, I, can, I can go a step further and I can say this is minus C D by D by T energy as a function of test flux. So this is a way of calculating the current through the system by asking how the energy varies as a function of flux passing through uh, the cylinder or how the energy depends on the variation on, on the change to boundary conditions. So you now what this is doing is essentially changing the boundary conditions. Okay, so let's take this formula and ask what this means. So we will see that in general, this is very hard to calculate. So as we change the flux, uh, this is going to oscillate a little bit. But one of the things, one of the clever things that Laughlin did, he said, well, let me approximate this by asking how much the energy changes when I change the test flux by one flux quantum. And we'll see that there is a neat way to calculate this quantity. So we have approximated this derivative. So, so far, this is all exact up to this point. But here, so this means that you have changed the test flux by a small amount and ask how much is the change in the energy. Now we are going to say that that small amount will take to be precisely one flux quantum and ask what's the change in the energy, okay? So is this all clear so far? Okay, now let's ask how we can calculate this. So remember what the states look like. The states look like lines. and each line is labeled by a kx. So for when we impose periodic boundary conditions, the kx wave vector takes some discrete values as we saw last time. And these are the discrete values. Uh, so these are ordered uh, you know, single particle states uh, with each one having a kx label. So the question is, as I change, so, so this would look like this here. Okay, so all of these eigen, all of these single particle eigenstates, they go around. And the question we are asking is, suppose I change alpha, or suppose I change the test flux from zero to one flux quantum, adiabatically, slowly, what happens to the system and what is the change in the energy. So uh, the result, let me tell you what the result is and then tell you how to understand the result or how to derive the result. The result is that 
as we change the test flux by one unit, this eigenstate moves to this, this eigenstate moves to this, this eigenstate moves to this, this to this, this to this. So each eigenstate moves to the next eigenstate. So let's see how, and, and therefore, so let me also derive uh, the result uh, for in, in, the, in the presence of disorder or in the absence of disorder when the filling factor is precisely n. So let's say all of these states are occupied. Okay. So if all of them are occupied, so each one is carrying an electron and when each state moves to the next state, then the electron moves with it to the next state and eventually the effect of piercing one flux quantum is that we have taken one electron on one edge and moved it to the other edge. And that's what we have done. So uh, therefore, what is delta u? So again, this is, you know, this is the first step of, of, of uh, this argument where we are deriving a result that we knew earlier by a different method. So delta u is simply E times Hall voltage. Okay, it's E times the chemical, the difference between the electrochemical potentials between the two edges, which is precisely what the voltmeter measures. And if, if there are N lambda levels, then the same thing happens in each lambda level. So that would give a total change in the energy, which is N times E times V all, divided by phi dot, which is HC over E. So you see C cancels out, and we find a result, which is N E squared over H. VH, and this gives us all resistance. Okay, so uh, here I have assumed this result that each state moves to the next one. Let's uh, let's see how we can derive this result. So. Uh, the derivation is fairly straightforward for the system which has no disorder. So uh, again, I take a single particle Hamiltonian. Okay. And I want to solve the problem H psi equals e psi for this. So, you know, earlier we did that without this term. We know how to do it without this term. The question is what happens to the Hamiltonian when we have this extra term? It turns out that the solution that we had earlier also applies to this problem after a little gauge transformation. So let's make a gauge transformation where we replace psi, which is the physical wave function of the system, uh, by e to the power minus i e over h bar c. Or, or let's... Okay, so let's, uh, let's make the substitution in this equation. So when the, when the uh, moment of operator acts on this, it produces an extra term which precisely cancels this part. So the new problem that we have is H primed, Psi primed equals E Psi primed, where H primed is our familiar Hamiltonian. 
that we know how to solve. Okay. So we know the solutions of this. In particular, we know that psi primed has a form like this. So remember what we did last time, we applied periodic boundary conditions. So we'll do the same. But we have to remember that the periodic boundary condition acts on the physical electron, physical problem, which is psi. The physical wave function is psi, not psi prime. Psi prime is something that we encounter on the way to the solution. There is no, I mean, there is no physical meaning to be attached to psi prime. So if I go here, I find that the solution goes like e to the power minus i pi alpha x over L plus I k x x times something else. So there is also a component of the wave function which depends on the y component. Okay. But that's not relevant to us uh, for, for the present problem. So therefore I say I want to apply periodic boundary conditions. So that means that if I replace x by x plus l, the phase changes by an integer multiple of 2 pi. So uh, that means e to the power minus i 2 pi alpha l divided by l plus i k x l. So periodic boundary condition means this thing where j is an integer. Okay, so this just means that if I replace, if I say that this quantity is equal to the same quantity with x replaced by x plus l, then it would give me this equation. And this equation means that kx is 2 pi over l j minus alpha. So now you can see uh, the statement that I made. So uh, as I change alpha from 0 to 1, this integer j changes by 1 unit. So my kx goes to the next kx. Of course, whether it decreases or increases by 1 unit depends upon the direction in which you are inserting this uh, test flux. So that's the proof of this state. Now, of course, we, we are not done yet. I mean, the actual argument is coming now. So right now, we have only derived the result that if the filling factor is an integer, we get this result. But we have to show that this result is true even when the filling factor is not an integer as we go slightly away from the integer filling. So there, the idea of Laughlin's was the following. Let me now put some disorder in the system. So let's again. Okay, so that's my cylinder. And I'm going to assume that I don't put any disorder close to the boundaries. So this is like trying to prove uh, a concept. Uh, so we don't put any disorder close to the boundaries. We put disorder here. We saw earlier today that the disorder localizes substates. And of course, I will also have some, some of these other
So I will have two types of states. The states that go around the cylinder, like this one, this one, or this one, and the states that do not go around the cylinder, that just uh, are localized in one region. So when we insert this flux, so let's say I change this flux slowly, nothing happens to these states because I'm not changing the boundary conditions for these states at all. Okay, these states remain exactly the way, they are completely unaware of the fact that there is this other flux. I mean, they are not sensitive to the boundary conditions. Okay. On the other hand, these states which go around this flux, they are sensitive to the boundary conditions. So this one will go here, this one will go here, this one will go here, this here, this here. Now, let's assume that all of these states that go around the cylinder, they are all occupied. Okay. If they are all occupied, so I'm assuming that these guys are all occupied. I don't say anything about these localized states. I don't care whether they are occupied or not. I assume that all of these states which go around are occupied. Then again, I get the result that, uh, that when I change the flux by one unit, the energy is changed precisely by an amount that can be calculated by, by noticing that n electrons go from here to here, where n is the number of lambda levels. Okay, so this happens for each lambda level. And therefore, uh, we get the same result. We get exactly the same result. So long as all of these extended states are occupied. So, so the picture that appears is as follows. Uh, so this is something I had drawn in the morning. These are our piston lambda levels in the absence of disorder. When we have disorder, the lambda levels broaden. But there is, there are extended states here. So I, I can even use colored chalks. So I'm, for simplicity, I'm showing a band of extended states and then I have localized states here. So, so long as the Fermi level lies in the region that is localized, I get quantized all resistance. I get a plateau. The value of that is precisely given by this, where N now counts the number of extended bands below the Fermi energy. So that's uh, Laughlin's uh, gauge argument. The, uh, the crucial things, there are two crucial things in this argument. First of all, we have to uh, start with a system which in, in uh, technical terms, it's incompressible at integer filling factors, which means that when the filling factor is an integer, I have gap to excitations. I fill n lambda levels completely and it cost some energy to excite a particle to a higher lambda level. So that's number one. And the second thing that we need is disorder, which localizes some states. And it acts as a reservoir, uh, which does not affect transport at all. As I empty these uh, localized states, it does not change any of the transport coefficients. So any questions on this, this part? No, N is the number of lambda levels. So this is a picture for one lambda level. Okay, but there is a similar picture for the second lambda level and a similar picture for third lambda level and so on. 
So these are all the lambda levels that are below the Fermi energy. Okay. So if if I consider only the lowest lambda level, then n is one. So it's uh, another way is n is the number of these extended bands below the Fermi energy. So if I'm here, I have two two of these bands, which actually is the number of lambda levels below the Fermi. Yes, please. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, you could uh, have a situation where, uh, I mean, so this, uh, okay. So if your Fermi energy is here, then you have you have no extended states. Okay, so then you you see a, an insulator, and uh, let's let's consider the following situation. Let's say my Fermi energy is here, which means uh, the number of electrons I have they fill all states up to this energy. Now let me increase the disorder. So now with disorder, let me draw this figure again. So this can become very broad, and this lambda level can also become very broad, and this becomes very broad, and the Fermi energy will go somewhere here. Okay, because I have sta localized states from higher lambda levels that, I, that electrons can fill at lower energies. So eventually, I mean, this, you can say it's, there is a name for this, it's called floating up of extended states because relative to the Fermi energy, the extended states are kind of rising up. But eventually you can, you can uh, get to, uh, to uh, uh, an insulator which is just a regular insulator. Yeah, exactly. So there will be an energy where you have an extended state. So this is uh, this is a statement in like it is true in the asymptotia. You have an infinitely large sample, and you have random disorder. Of course, if you if you have a finite sample and you break it into two, then you I mean this goes away. But uh, it's uh, it's believed to be true conceptually that for a sufficiently large system, you cannot get rid of these extended states at one energy. Uh, it's it's not one extended state. It's extended state at one energy. So there can be many extended states. It's uh, not very easy to see. So uh, in in the kind of picture that I drew, so if let's say I have smooth potential, for that it's easy to see because it's a percolation transition. So imagine you have like you know hills and valleys and so on, and you start filling water. Okay, so water tells you where the sample is filled and uh, the region outside, region not covered by water is like these potential hills. Now, up to some point, the land percolates, but at some point, the water percolates and at the transition, there is an extended state. So the percolation length goes to infinity. Uh, so that's like classical percolation picture that remains true even in quantum Hall effect, although the quantum mechanical nature changes the exponents and so on, but the overall picture remains true. But, you know, that's a simple picture, but you could ask what happens if I take delta function disorder, and at least numerical calculations say that again, there is, uh, there are extended states at a, at a single energy. Any other question? Yes, please. Well, that, that follows from this. So as I change, so let's say I start with a state which has j equal to 10, then and alpha equals zero. As I change alpha from zero to one, this integer becomes nine. 
so the wave vector and remember there is a connection between the wave vector and the position of the state okay so as the wave vector change changes i mean so by changing the boundary condition you are actually changing the wave vector and since wave vector is connected to the position this thing is slowly moving toward one side yeah so periodic boundary condition is a nice way to derive the result uh i mean there are other ways to see this so this is also connected to what is known as churn number uh so there are other ways to see this but i mean that's a generalization of laplace gauge argument so if you take lambda levels on let's say a lattice uh then they have the property that the churn number is 1 and this is something you cannot change discontinuously as you cannot change continuously you can only change it discontinuously okay. so uh so there are more rigorous arguments uh which i mean even there you do make use of periodic boundary conditions because you have to have this block torus uh so anyway assuming that the results that the real physics real uh, coefficients do not depend on the choice of boundary conditions you know this is one way to derive this yeah 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 so in going from here to here uh i am now talking about some more general situation so what i have done here is that i have assumed that i have well defined wave vector in this region and this region okay and then there is no wave ve wave vector defined for these states these are going to be some very complicated states which would depend on the actual disorder that is well there is a mobility edge but it's just one so typically mobility edge means all states below are uh, extended and all above are localized but here it's a different problem because you have extended states only at some discrete energies okay so uh let me if since i have some time let me go to fractal hall effect and introduce laplace wave function because uh uh since we are talking about laplace theory for integer hall effect here let's go to his work for fractal hall effect so uh so one thing you can see already is that if i assume electrons to be non interacting if i ignore the interaction between electrons then i can only get h over an integer times e squared by this argument you cannot get anything else so the question is how do we get a fraction so one has to introduce interaction to do that and therefore we are going to now uh write the following hamiltonian that's our hamiltonian and i will continue to uh, assume that the system is fully spin polarized so we won't talk about spin explicitly now i am further going to make an approximation that the magnetic field is so large 
you know, so I want to consider a filling factor which is like one third, you know, a fractional filling. So I am going to assume that the magnetic field is so large that that my interaction does not couple the system to higher land elements. Okay. So of course, if there is no interaction, all electrons will go live in the lowest land level happily. Interaction can push them into higher land levels, but we'll assume that the cyclotron energy is, let's say, infinitely large. So therefore, we are going to throw away these higher land levels, keep only the lowest land level. And what does that mean? That means that this guy is precisely, remember the kinetic energy for the lowest lambda level is just one half h bar omega c. So that's just a constant. And by taking some, by choosing my constants, I mean my dimension of the energy or unit of the energy appropriately, I can write this very simple looking Hamiltonian. Okay. So that is the Hamiltonian of the fractal Hall effect. Remember, we have to work within the lowest lambda level subspace. In fact, this is crucial because if we don't think about it, you may say, well, there is nothing quantum mechanical about this Hamilton. So all R's, they commute with one another, and therefore it's just like a classical Hamiltonian. But it turns out that if you restrict to the lowest lambda level, then X and Y do not commute. Uh, so anyway, that's the problem. Uh, now. What does the situation look like? So let's consider filling factor one third. Okay, so first of all, by taking analogy from integer quantum Hall effect, we know what we are trying to show. We are trying to show that somehow, because of interactions, we have a state here. It's a many body state, but there is a gap to excitations. So remember an integer Hall effect, uh, Without disorder, the system had the property that whenever the filling factor is an integer, there is a gap to excitations. So you say the system is incompressible. So we would like, we are looking for a state that is incompressible at filling factor one third. That was the first fraction that was seen. Uh, but if you, if you are at Filling factor one third, that means if you if you take the lowest lambda level, and you know, if I if I make a grid which roughly tells me how many states there are, degeneracy of the lowest lambda level, then the number of ways in which you can put electrons into these available states is huge. So, you know, Vijay talked about this earlier. So at filling factor one third, the total number of available single particle states is three n. Okay, I have three times as many states as number of electrons, and therefore the degeneracy of many body states. So I should say distinct number of many body states. I should not say degeneracy. It's a uh, It's three n choose n, and if you if you take n to be you know a number, a typical experimental number which is like a billion, this number is enormously huge. Okay, it's exponentially large. So we have a huge number of possible states. Uh, so the question is how to how to how to 
start to think about this problem. Uh, I mean, another thing that condensed matter people we like is uh, small parameters. So Landa famously said in one of his papers that the job of a theorist is to find a small parameter. Because once you have a small parameter, you, you know how to do perturbation theory. So typically, all the problems that we encounter, we want to write it as a sum of two Hamiltonians, one that we know how to solve plus something that's small. So we can, do, we can do perturbation theory around this, but we don't have that, we don't have that here. So we, I mean this, there is no H naught for this problem. So how to proceed? So well, the method that uh, Laughlin used is uh, the Feynman method. Okay, you stare at the problem, for a long time and then you write down the solution. You have no idea how you got the solution, but then you test the solution. So, uh, so that's pretty much the approach in fractional polymer. Uh, you, you have to look at the experiments or by intuition you try to guess a solution and then see whether it uh, really works. So Laughlin's approach was as follows. First of all, he said that any wave function, so remember a single particle wave function has the form z to some power times a Gaussian factor. So the point was that in the lowest lambda level, this depends only on z, there is no z power. So any wave function should be expressible Times a Gaussian factor. I won't write down the Gaussian factor explicitly. So any wave function is some polynomial of uh, of the z's, no z bars. Okay, so that's an exact statement for any lowest lambda level wave function. Now the main assumption that was made was to say that this has a Jastro form. Now, Jastrow form is something that has been used in nuclear physics. It's used in uh, helium physics. And what it says is that the, I mean, so we have to include some correlations between particles and we are going to do it pairwise. So we are going to say that this wave function has the form It's an assumption. And we will see that in general, general fractional Hall states cannot be written in this way. They have much more complicated uh, structure. But we'll see that at least some fractional Hall states can be written in this way. So is this clear? So I'm trying to build correlations pairwise. So I take all pairs and write some wave function for each pair and then take product of all them. Now the third assumption, or it's not an assumption, it's really saying that we want to make sure that the, uh, that the wave function is an eigenstate of the total angular momentum. So what does that mean? Uh, remember, z to the power m has angular momentum m. Okay. Uh, if I have two particles, and let's say I want angular momentum four, I can write z1 to the power one, z to the power three, and I can couple it to z1 to the power zero, z to the power four, and so on, with some coefficients. So the total degree of the polynomial must be the same. Okay, what that means is that each of these guys also have a well-defined angular momentum. Uh, so therefore, the only possibility you have so the first step follows by assuming that 
it's a, it has a JASTO form. The second step follows by assuming that you want the total wave function to be the, an eigenstate of the total angular momentum. And let me put back the Gaussian factor. And then you ask the question, what is this M? Is there a constraint on M? What values can it take? So M must be an odd integer. Okay, so M can take values one, three, five. If I put M equal to one, does it describe any state? Filling factor one. So Laughlin said, we can put M equal to three, M equals five, and so on. And uh, tomorrow, I'm going to show that this state actually describes a state at filling factor one over m. In fact, let me let me yes. Uh, so, what we we assume in when we write JASTO form, we assume that this F is the same for all pairs. Okay. So that just No, because you have to assume that uh, the, I mean there is indistinguishability, so all pairs have to behave in the same fashion. So if you play with this, you will realize that it doesn't work. Okay, let's let me just calculate the filling factor very quickly in a cheap way, and uh, then we can go on to some problems and solutions. So uh, I'm going to assume that this wave function is uniform. Okay, I have not shown that. I'm going to assume that it, uh, if, you, if you plot the density of this, which you can do on the computer, then it's going to be uniform density modulo edge effects. So it, it's going to represent a disk of some radius, okay, but inside it's uniform. Density is uniform. So let me assume that. Then how do I calculate the filling factor? So let me assume n electrons. So can someone tell me how many states are there in the disk? Let's, uh, let me give you a hint. So, uh, okay, let me just do the problem because if I give you a hint, I will effectively have done the problem. So, look at the largest power of, let's say, Z1. What is the largest power of Z1? n times m. This is correct. So, because you can see, if I write all the terms which include 1, so from this you can see largest power of z1 is, so there are n minus 1 factors. And you can get, so the largest power is m times n minus 1. So the total number of states in the disk, so the smallest power is, of course, 0. So the total number of states is m times n minus 1 plus 1, okay, counting the 0. So the filling factor is equal to the number of particles divided by the total number of states. And 
and I will assume a very large system. I will assume n goes to infinity. It gives you a filling factor 1 over m. So since m can be 3, that gives you 1 third. So that's Laughlin's wave function for the first observed state. That's the 1 third state. A prediction of this theory is that there should also be fractal Hall effect at 1 over 5. And indeed, later experiments saw uh, 1 over 5. It does not work. This wave function does not work if you take m to be some fraction or even integer. So in some sense, this gives you some idea for why 1 half is not very strong because it, you cannot put m equal to 2. Okay? But it's not really an explanation of uh, the absence of one half because it doesn't tell you what exactly is the state at filling factor one half. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. And in the remaining half an hour or so, uh, could, uh, let's work out some of these problems. And I would ask somebody to come to the, to the board and volunteer to do one of these problems. So let's say, how about problem number three? 